Welcome. Welcome to SAIS. How many, for how many of you is this your first time visiting the school? Oh, good. Okay, wonderful. Well, welcome. Um, my name is Shamila Chaudhry. I, I have been here at SAIS for six years. I'm senior advisor to Dean Valley Nasser, and I also run an initiative out of the Foreign Policy Institute called The Big Picture, which looks at international affairs and foreign policy issues through arts and culture and non kind of IR perspective. So this event is being hosted um, through that initiative. And um, today we have a very special conversation um, and I'm actually going to turn it over to one of our students, Michelle Kazarian, who is an MA candidate in Middle East studies and also European and Eurasian studies. She's going to introduce the speaker today and um, talk about the format of the event and why it's important that we're doing this. But I just wanted to emphasize how special this event is to us because we have a long-term relationship with the Karm Foundation and with its CEO and founder, Lena Attar. Um, we did an exhibit with them um, last year at um, a refugee festival here in DC and it was very widely attended and um, doing something else with her and the foundation is just, you know, it's an example of our commitment to the issue and uh, we know that there's a lot of interest in the DC area and the policy community on this topic. So we thank you for coming. We know you have a lot of other events that you can go to and we're also happy to feed you today. So enjoy the pizza. Um, there will be a reception afterwards with more kind of goodies as well. So Michelle, why don't you please come up to the podium? Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Reconstruction Starts Here, Building a Better Future for Syrian Refugee Youth, um, hosted by the Foreign Policy Institute and the Big Picture Initiative. My name is Michelle Kazarian, and I am a MA candidate here at SAIS, and I work with the Big Picture Initiative. Um, the Big Picture is a new forum at SAIS that explores international affairs through arts and culture. Our initiatives are guided by the ideas that better policy results from engaging in interdisciplinary conversations across sectors. And we are committed to collaboration, dialogue, and exploration because at SAIS, we train students to improve the global human condition and this series serves as extension of that education. I am honored to welcome to the stage today, Lina Sergi Attar. She is the founder and CEO of the Karam Foundation and a Syrian American architect and writer from Aleppo. She is co-founder of the How Many More Project. She serves as chair of the board of directors of the Syria Campaign and as a non-resident fellow at New America. Um, her writing has appeared in outlets ranging from the New York Times to Foreign Policy, and she has appeared in media outlets that include CNN, BBC, and NPR. Her work has served in the past several years to bring to the world's attention the difficulties that Syrian refugees, particularly Syrian youth, face in their new host countries as they work towards rebuilding their lives and envisioning a future for themselves and their families. Joining the discussion today is Dr. Robert McKenzie, who is a domestic and foreign policy analyst and scholar, a senior fellow at New America and director of its Muslim Diaspora Initiative, and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, as well as, as, well as Shamila Chaudhry, who is senior advisor to Dean Bali Nasser and director of the Big Picture Forum. And I'd like to welcome Lena to deliver her remarks and will be followed by a panel and Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Um, I want to thank Johns Hopkins School of International Studies, Advanced International Studies, and Shamila for uh, bringing me here again. It's really wonderful to be here, and I really am grateful to the entire big picture team that takes on these projects that are really a lot of times overlooked um, and really putting, um, you know, elevating them and amplifying the work and the voices of people that really need attention. Um, this is me at uh, late 90s, and it's me at Rhode Island School of Design. Um, it was my first year at sc architecture school there. Um, I'd been there for a few months before coming. It was my, um, I was born in the United States and moved to Syria when I was 12 with my family. And this is when I came back home um, to the United States, leaving Syria after graduating from the University of Aleppo in architecture. And um, this 
picture. When I went to RISD, um, I had come from University of Aleppo studying five years, graduating at the top of my class, not just in my, my department or my university, but across the four universities in Syria, coming thinking I knew so much. And, uh, but I wanted to get out of Syria, and I wanted to go to the place that's opposite of the kind of learning that we did in University of Aleppo and even in the schools, which is so much about rote memorization and so technical and without any creativity, even though the architecture school is probably the most creative of the departments um, in the universities. So I chose Rhode Island School of Design because it was the opposite place to go to. But the first six months there, um, I cried every day because I felt like I didn't know anything and I couldn't even understand what people were doing. And, uh, and it was all about that idea of really understanding creatively what we can do and seeing all these artists and all different kinds of people doing really, really amazing things. I felt that my brain was stretching during that time. And I felt, I say this, I felt like my brain was being rewired and I became a new person from my three years at RISD. I experienced that. And and it changed forever how I see things and how I see the world. And I learned a really important lesson that I come, to back, I come back to over and over again, which is if you see differently, you'll begin to do differently. Um, this is the first time I tell a story like that to start one of my Syria talks, um, which I've given many of over the past seven years too many Syria talks and too many Syria interviews. And usually they start with an image like this one, which is Aleppo after the destruction, very different from, actually this image with this image go pretty well together because that's before and this is an after. Um, most of what you see here in this image does, is, is behind this um, mosque because this image is taken from the citadel and here you have it from the mosque towards the citadel. The in-between doesn't exist anymore. So most of what you see here is destroyed. Um, seven years of war, we've told every possible story we could think of about Syria. Um, we've talked about the destruction. We've talked about all the different ways that we have suffered and Syrians have suffered and the displacement. And all of that is to make the audiences, audiences like you, to feel something, to do something, to, that something would happen to stop the madness of war and pain and loss. We've learned over the years even what kind of images will move an audience, a global audience, um, like this image that went viral in 2015 and really captivated the world and, and talked about the refugee crisis. And we've learned that to move people, it has to be an image like this one, usually of a child. Um, bloodless is better. Um, faceless is better. Um, having these details like a red t-shirt and new shoes makes this child feel, his name is Elan Kurdi, um, this child feels like he could be your son, your brother, he could be part of you. Or an image like this one, Amran from Aleppo, and uh, he also made the news a year later, 2016, um, at the beginning of the onslaught against Aleppo. And this is also an image that went viral because it was literally a shell-shocked child and, uh, and moved the world to think about Syria. But these things happen um, infrequently and they happen, when they don't happen, people think that these things are not happening right now in Syria when they actually are happening every single day until today. The war is still going on. And we've learned that images like this one move people where statistics don't. And um, these are the statistics on Syria. It's staggering. Um, almost half the population no longer lives in their homes. Half of them displaced inside the country and the other half outside the country. Over 500,000 Syrians are dead, one in four refugees are Syrian, and over one million Syrian kids are no longer in school. These numbers are our truth. They're even, these numbers are even lower than what, they, what the reality is. And, but these numbers also leave audiences numb, it leaves them helpless, and it makes, makes people feel, we hear, hear a lot, fatigued, desensitized, also about tr the tragedy of real, life, real lives and real people that are continuing every single day. 
images like these, which is Zatari camp in 2013 or 14, you know, mass displacement, um, mass death, um, mass destruction, leave all of us very helpless and hopeless and feeling like we can't do anything. And then you have the refugees. Um, who are fall, fall into two different sides, Mo the majority of them in this side of image where um, you the refugee is a victim. We don't know anything about him except for his current tragedy passing in the boats from Turkey to Greece and uh, many people who didn't survive that journey. But, um, but we don't know the story of who he was and where he left behind and what, um, who his children are and what he's lost. And we, these refugees, these images are really powerful because they make us feel empathy towards people like this man, but at the same time they create a separation between, that, between us because these images make the, this, these people feel more them than us. And the other extreme is refugee as hero. Um, where this is, you know, probably the top example, Yusra Mardini, um, the teenager who is a, was a, a national swimmer in one of those boats, and um, their boat had, thir had about 30 people on it, and it was sinking, and her and four people, including her sister, got out of the boat and started swimming and pulling the boat for three hours, saving everybody on that boat. She later was, went to, when she went to Germany, she joined Team Refugees, um, um, in the Olympics, and that's what she's known for. But it also creates, we've, he we've heard, I've, I'm sure all of you have seen stories about refugees. You know, this refugee who opened this amazing new restaurant, this refugee who was a tailor and saved a, a Canadian bride's dress. Um, this, like, these really, like, uh, like over-the-top stories of refugees as heroes, which makes you feel like unless they actually do this un impossible feat, then they're really not worthy of our attention or being welcomed or just being accepted into any community. So these stories are not the ones that I want to talk to you about. Um, it's time to stop having the stories that are only made to, create, to make audiences feel empathy or feel relatable. I want to think, have you think about a different kind of story for Syrian refugee teens like Yusra, um, the hundreds of thousands of them that didn't have the chance that she had to become the hero. And the story is about asking a simple question, what if? So, actually, could we dim the lights a little bit more? Because the sides are a little bit faded. What if Syrian refugee teens were problem solvers and not the problem? And what if they were creative, critical thinkers? And what if Syrian refugee teens were really consumed with learning languages and attending college courses? And what if they really loved to play board games with their friends? And what if Syrian refugee teens could learn how to develop, design, and build their ideas, any idea? And what if they had access to every single technological tool that they could imagine, um, having the best of everything? And what if they're taught by a, by a group of mentors who are actually Syrian refugees themselves, young architects, engineers, teachers, uh, people with different backgrounds, and they come from the community. So these projects and these ideas are not coming imposed from the outside, but actually being given to them by members of their own community who've had the same experiences as, that they have had. And what if all of this was happening in a building that really rose to the expectations of Syrian refugee teens, to any teen really, that really shows them this, they matter, they, they're worthy, this is the kind of space that they deserve. And it happened in spaces where there was, it was limitless and pos everything is possible. What if we gave the most to those who need it the most, to those who have lost the most? I want to show you a video now. If you guys follow our work on Facebook or we have a YouTube channel, the videos that come out of Karam House, Istanbul, and Reyhanle are all made by two Syrian refugee de graphic designers. Our lead designer in, um, in Reyhanle is actually 21 years old. He became a refugee when he was 15. And 
Um, he lost his father and his cousin in the war, and uh, they, he moved with his family to Rehanle, and he taught himself how to do graphic design by watching YouTube videos, and we ha hired him two years ago. Um, he's taken these portraits, his name is Suleiman, um, that are part of the exhibit as well, extremely talented, and now we've hired our second um, graphic designer named Bishad, who works with Suleiman now, and they actually produce the content, um, they produce the videos, they, they tell the stories um, from inside the house um, to the world, and that's what we use to promote you know, the work that we do. So it's really important that they tell their own stories and produce the, their own work. Kerem House is, um, in Rehande has been open for a year and a half now. They've just started their second school year. We have about a thousand kids attending um, Kerem House Rehande, which is really incredible. And we, I was just at the opening of Kerem House Istanbul just a few weeks ago, and we already have over 80 kids signed up for the courses. Um, it's, it's a place for kids that are aged 14 to 18, boys and girls, and it's open also to Turkish citizens as well. It's open to everybody in the community. So we do have a few Turkish kids attending Kerem House Reyhanve, and I expect that number to grow higher in Istanbul. Um, this is Yasir and Hussein, and I'm gonna go through a few of our kids that attend as well as their inventions and projects while I tell you about what they, how they actually study at Kerem House. So this is Yasir, um, the younger one. He lives across the street from Kerem House Reyhanve, and he's there all day, every day, attends every workshop, and he wanted a GoPro um, because he wanted to film something in a specific way, and we told him we don't have a budget for a GoPro, so he went and built this skateboard that, ha that he could put his camera on, and it will move across back and forth so he could actually film movement, um, so he did that himself. Uh, this is Muhammad and Ahmed in our library in Rehanle. And uh, a little bit about what we do and teach at Karam House. It's really STEAM based learning, a lot of technology, a lot of entrepreneurship, arts, um, creative design. And what kids do is that basically sign up for a studio and they take, it's very similar to architecture school, no surprise. <laughs> And it's, uh, they get to come in and they get a problem. And the problem is a real life problem. So some of the things that they've done that you'll see a lot of here is because we we're doing that in the spring, which is designing a prosthetic for real life amputee cases or paralysis cases in Rehande. So, And it was a virtual exchange program that we do um, through a grant through the Aspen Institute, um, the Stevens Initiative, and, uh, and also uh, schools in the United States doing the same program. So you have have Syrian kids working alongside American teens working on a real problem. Um, the problem needs to have a design element. They learn, they learn to draw it, they transfer it to the computer, then they use the maker space with all of their, um, you know, their, their laser cutters and their 3D printers to actually build the prototypes and make it create, create a real solution. And they document it They ha on, online, on an online portal. Um, which everybody can has access to and you can see it, and they also have to write about it. So all of these things together create these skills that you just don't get in school, and it creates these skills that you could use to get a really good job, get into a really good university, and what we want to do is create leadership. This is um, Abdullah and Walid, and they are, they are part of the ones, this is an exo, exo, exoskeleton that they designed for a man that has paralysis um, in order to be able to use um, his sling in a way that would be useful to his d daily life. Um, the way that the kids worked on these things is interviewing these cases, documenting the cases, and going and testing it, measuring it um, over and over again until they could get it into a perfect way. Um, the, the curriculum that we do is designed in um, conjunction with an innovation school here in Cambridge, Massachusetts called Nuvu Studio. It was also established by a Syrian architect. His name is Saeed, and he created this about seven years ago because he wanted to change the way American kids went to school. So that's what he's been doing and then we've partnered with him to deliver this really high-end curriculum that's being delivered in elite schools in America to Syrian refugee kids. Of course, all of it is free. 
This is Hiba and Kifah. Um, they're really amazing. Kifah especially wants to become a journalist. And her sister, Sabah, who we've helped as well, is in medical school now in Turkey. And um, they also were part of the design, the prosthetic team. And um, one thing that's really important for us is that the work that we do is very community driven. Um, it has to be things that are coming from the community. So a lot of times the kids themselves or the mentors will come up with the problems that we need to be working on. And we also want to be co-authoring our solutions with the community because that's how we can create solutions that actually have deep impact and are not like the way that are, where it's usually done by a nonprofit organization imposing a solution and then figuring out later that the community just hasn't really bought into this. So the kids really love, love attending Kerem House, but the parents themselves love it even more. They come to the exhibitions. They, they, they actually told me when I was at the opening of the Kerem House in Istanbul, so many parents told me, well, we wish that we were 14 again so we could come back here. We want to discover our dreams too. And that's really, really important that the parents see the value in this kind of education. Um, here is um, yes, is, um, invention, and, and we'll go through a few of the works that they've done. Um, this was also made for a little girl who had um, a limp in one of her legs, and she was able to use this to walk. Um, also a different kind of prosthetic. And you can see here all of the different materials and the techniques that they use. And here I love this one because for this little girl, they added a little bit of fun to her um, little boots that she needed to wear um, to make it more, you know, like appropriate for a little girl. Um, some of the projects that we're working on now are really exciting. Um, the one that I really love is that they're working on a project for the elderly. And this is also with New View Studio in Cambridge. So the kids in, in, in Cambridge had to visit a nursing home and to interview elderly people to ask them what, what problems that they have in their everyday life that they could design solutions for. And when this problem came to the Kenham House mentors and the kids, they said, well, we don't know any elderly here. We don't think we have a nursing home. And we actually said, actually, I'm sure Ray Hanley has a nursing home. You have to go find it. And so they did. And they realized that there is a Turkish um, nursing home for the elderly in Rayhanle, and they had to go in there and interview the elderly and ask them their life stories and sketch them and ask them what the kinds of things that they need. And the images from that, oh, we don't have that image, but the images from that is a, um, it's really powerful because imagine the dynamic of a refugee teenager in a host community um, interacting with the elderly from that host community. Those are two segments of society that would never ever meet, let alone be dependent on um, one for their project and the other one they're creating a solution. And um, the images and the videos from that is so moving because you know suddenly for these Turkish people, the Syrian refugee youth actually are, like you know they're producing something, they're doing something, they're giving something. And for the Syrian kids, they feel that pride that they're giving something to people who need it too. They're not a burden. They're actually part of contributing to um, being like doing something positive in society. So these kinds of stories, you know, another one that we're doing in Rehandle is building a playground. Um, and the kids are designing it and we will build it as a gift to this town. Rehandle was a town that had 60,000 Turkish people living there before the war. And now they have over 120,000 Syrian refugees living there. So for for this town that doubled in size uh, over the past six years and so much change happened, we wanted to do this as a gesture of thanks to the town and, um, and they were floored by it. When I met the mayor, they, he said, this has never happened before and just imagine Syrian kids at the same time, Syrian families walking by this playground saying, we built this for this town, this is part of our community, this is, part, this is our home and it, all, these kinds of interactions do strengthen communities and change things for the better. So why is this important now, um, especially when, um, I'm sure this will come up in the panel, when really Syria is not even in the news anymore, um, it seems as bleak as ever, um, and there's so many um, different things happening um, with the 
you know, the camp in, um, the Rakban camp in the south, where people are suffering, the three million people in Idlib with their fates unknown, um, all of this stuff happening, this kind could seem a little bit frivolous. Uh, but one thing that happened to me, another story that happened to me a few months ago, is that I met an actor in Chicago, and he's originally Arab, and one of the people, you know, on, you know, on our side, um, understands the importance of all of this work. But we start talking about politics, and when we start talking about the politics of Syria, things get really um, murky very quickly because you'll get the question that every Syrian, the Syrians here in the room, will know that we've gotten from the very first day of the revolution in March 2011, which is if there is an uprising, what is the alternative? Constantly, this is a question that we've been asked for seven and a half years. You talk about all of these things, you talk about activists, you talk about people in Syria being really, you know, civil society, people building things, people doing things, and then they say, well, what's the use? You don't have an alternative. What is the alternative to the Syrian regime? And when he asked me that, for some reason, it seemed different because I, I thought about it a lot and I thought that. Um, it's actually a very insulting question to ask a Syrian um, of what is the alternative, as if out of 24 million people, we don't have anybody who could rule except for this regime, this criminal regime that's committed genocide in Syria, and that there's a very easy answer to this question, is that the Syrian people are the alternatives. We might not have, you know, a person who's an alternative, but we do have many, many people, and many of them we've lost already, but this got me to thinking about how these kids that we're working with are actually the alternatives um, to what's happening in Syria and we can build the future by empowering them and to become future leaders and this idea of the talk of reconstruction you know that you hear a lot about here I'm sure for you guys in in school and this is kind of the thing is that people when are, they are talking about Syria now they'll talk about reconstruction plans and also that is so shameful to even be discussing reconstruction while people are still dying and and this regime is still destroying and there's no kind of freedom for anybody and people talk about the right of return of refugees and the, we don't think about the reason why these people became refugees to begin with is still in power so these kinds of concepts that just are thrown out there to almost see, almost are, are like let's just move on this war has gone too, on too long we're old news we need to wrap it up and move on and you see that so much in foreign policy here in um, in America in DC when it, re when it comes to Syria, like just how do we wrap it up? But you can't wrap something up when it's still ongoing, when the injustice, the cause of the injustice is still there. And that's why this becomes really important because the way I see it is that recon reconstruction really does start here. This, I mean, I can't end the war in Syria, and none of you can, even if we wanted to. But what we can do is change the impact and change the future and change the story in the future so that these kids could have a story that's very different than all of the other ones. This um, image is really this boy in white. His name is Yusuf, and um, he was in Rayhanle, and uh, he was moving with his family to Istanbul. And so one of our um, colleagues was visiting at the time, and he was very worried. He told her, I'm moving to Istanbul with my family, and if I'm really worried about going because in Istanbul we don't have a Kerem house. And she told him, we, we, we are, there's going to be a Kerem House opening. And so when I went to the opening, I saw him at the opening day. This is the opening day at Kerem House just three weeks ago, where he moved with his family, found the space, and was at there at opening night. And so he told um, Yasser, who, wor who works for Kerem, she's our director of development, he told her, there should be a Kerem House wherever there are Syrian kids. I think that's one of the biggest endorsements we've ever received and I feel so happy that we were that that we were able to be there for him when he moved and I do agree with that there should be a Kerem house wherever there are Syrian kids and maybe wherever there are refugee kids because that's what these kids do need and deserve um, and so that was really really a fortunate thing that happened 
So our goal for um, the next 10 years is to build 10,000 leaders in the next 10 years through these programs, primarily Kerem House, but we also have programs that provide kids with scholarships. We're going to be adding on a job training program for kids that graduate from Kerem House. And like I said, we already have 1,000 kids attending our programs, and so we're well on our way. Um, we do want to scale Kerem House to be um, d delivered perhaps in Jordan and Lebanon in the future so that we could scale our operations and reach more kids. And um, this girl, her name is Layla, and I really, when I saw her image, um, it, I got really moved by it because it, she reminded me of me. And I was thinking about the idea that, you know, this whole thing where we have to, as, as a viewer, as something, when you're looking at a crisis or anything that you're outside of, you're looking for those things that connect you to that person and you want to feel that empathy, you want to feel what it would feel like to be them. And I think in this image, what it represented to me is that um, this went beyond empathy. It be, was beyond me seeing, like she's not somebody like me, somebody like you, somebody like, who could be our daughter. She really is me. And, and even in a better way. The access that we're giving her, I can imagine her, that her brain is being rewired already, just the way mine was at RISD, that she's being able to see things differently and she's going to do things differently because of that. And she doesn't even know that this is happening and it's going to be part of her life and her viewpoint. Um, and that's what the really powerful thing about Kerem House is, is that these kids are unaware of all of this, but that what's happening is shaping their whole entire worldview. Like you saw, we have international mentors coming in and visiting um, and uh, giving a week of their time and they're getting exposed to journalists and artists and writers and entrepreneurs and all sorts of people so they get to see people from the outside as well and they also have their virtual exchange this is these are the kids that are doing the virtual exchange program with the kids at New View Studio and they meet with them a couple times a week to do their projects and um, they t connect together on Facebook they connect together they talk with each other and language is not a barrier. We used to have translators all the time, and we found out that the kids are just finding out how to communicate. And the kids, in, the, the refugee kids who say they don't know English, you leave them alone in the room with teen, American teenagers, and suddenly they know English. And all of this is happening, and it's just really, really exciting to see. So for me, these are the alternatives. Um, this is our mission. It, we're as far as away, away from war, far away from everybody who asks, where is the alternative? And um, I'm going to leave you with this image. I'd like to hope that you think of these kids when you see refugees represented in the media and you think about that vast gap between refugee as victim and refugee as hero and all these people in between that really do have limited, limitless potential, limitless possibility. They really can achieve everything. All they need is a chance and an opportunity. And I hope that you'll join us on this mission to build 10,000 leaders. There are many way, things that you could do. Um, um, look at our work, follow us on social media, share our work. If you're interested in volunteering, please let me know. Um, there's just many ways that all of us can get involved, and it really does have a long-term impact. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lena. Um, that was incredible. And the, the work of Karma House is, I mean, indeed made so much impact already, and it's great to hear that you have a broad vision for expanding. Yeah. Um, it's very exciting. So I have a lot of questions okay. for you. <laughs> I know I told you I was only gonna ask a few. Um, we have about 35 minutes, and I wanna bring Bobby into the conversation as well. So when we think of um, refugee, we think of someone who is transient mm -hmm. and on the move, and someone who is not kind of permanently that does not permanently belong where they are. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me when hearing you talk about these children and, and just following your work for the past year that Karam House actually gives them a sense of permanence. Mm -hmm. And so what I, what I wanted to know is how many of them are actually kind of in transit? How many of them are planning to stick around where they are and that the skills that they learn will actually go back into the communities um, I know you mentioned that one of them moved and yeah. you know, was, he, he felt very connected to Karm House. So that's part, one part of the question. And the second part of it is, 
because so many of these, the refugee communities are in transit and there may be this narrative within those communities of going back home at some point, um, how, how would they be able to go back home? And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's me picking up on your mention of reconstruction. Mm -hmm. um, what, would that, what would need to happen for, for those that want to go back home to go back home? Given your training as an architect, and you know, we talked a little bit about this when you came last um, mm -hmm. April, so I wanted to pick up on that theme too. So the kind of the sense of permanence or not permanence, and then this re uh, reconstruction question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the it's really um, it's really hard to talk about even the word refugee because, and while you were doing this work, because now we, a lot of these kids have been refugees for six, seven years, mm -hmm. um, and you know, five years. And so even for us, when we're doing this work, we're, all, we're very aware about the idea of how long do people are actually called refugees. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's coming up more and more where I see even the tendency, we've had these discussions just very recently, internally and also with other organizations and people that do you know, work in the humanitarian field, talking about, well, maybe we shouldn't even use the word refugee anymore because you know it's tainting them people think of refugees as terrorists or refugees as you know this caravan or all of the stuff that's going on that maybe if we don't call them refugees anymore then people won't look at them like that but i also think that that also strips away from their from their journey and from their from what they've been through and so i i don't necessarily agree that we should stop calling people refugees it's just that what's attached to the word is so uh, painful now and people are a lot of people you'll find them in Turkey Syrians will say no we're not refugees mm -hmm. and we're going to go back but the question of going back is very difficult as well because you know especially with the groups that we're working with we're working with the most impoverished um, and least educated segment of society of refugee society the people that really need a lot of help I mean most of these people where if they the places that they've come from in Syria are destroyed mm. so for them to they don't have the resources if they wanted to go back they wouldn't have anything really to go back to and then a lot and then most people and that's regardless of your economic status is that they have a very big fear of return because the 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 what they were fleeing from is still there whether it is um, the regime and other cases extremists um, so you do have some people pockets of people that return like for instance Aleppo there were people that returned um, but you'll have you have large areas of especially rural areas it'll be very difficult for people to return without having this fear that something would happen to them mm. And just in the experience so far with Karam House, do you feel like um, your work is filling a gap that the state is not providing to a certain extent? I mean, well, it's providing, a, it's a gap that actually like no state provides. No, yeah, they're not it's prepared really, to provide this it. This is not something, right. I mean, this is not, doesn't exist in America even. So mm -hmm. it's this whole, it's this concept of let's give them these really, really, really high end skills. So it's not about, you know, the, the and actually it works better for us because, you know, we are, we are partners. Um, in many ways with the Turkish government, you know, like they, we, we have a Turkish organization and we work under, you know, the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Education and so we, we don't provide things that are actually provided in the school. Mm -hmm. This is something that's extra um, and it's something that just really just changes the way people, you can think. Mm. But we're very cognizant about providing this to the areas of, in extreme need. So even when Turkish people from the community come, they're, they're also people that are not exposed to the, these ideas at all. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And how do you how do you apply to be part of Karam House? How do how do so people find you? They word of mouth. We do outreach at schools, um, and people find us. You know, at first it was really scary that I thought that nobody nobody was going to show up in Istanbul, and then suddenly the, the, their their weekend was filled with kids. Um, they people tell each other, um, and. The, they actually like bring each other along. So especially with the girls, the best way to, to do outreach with the girls is you bring the girl who has a brother there, and then the girl starts bringing all of her friends um, because that's kind of like, you know, they're working with teenagers, and they're also, it's a conservative society, but then everybody loves it. Um, 
but the outreach really is mo mostly Facebook, social media, word of mouth, and outreach at the schools. Um, that's really, really important to have. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I, I kind of want to go to Karam House myself. Yeah. It's, it seems really fun. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and it, it created a wonderful community there. It is. It's a lot of fun. They love it. Oh, but well, the other thing about it, they sign up. We don't turn anybody away. Okay. We do have a waiting list. But the thing is, the only thing that will get you out of Karam House is that if you don't attend. So we ask them that you have to commit to attending. And so they have to start with a 15-week course called Karam Lab, which now we have in Istanbul. All the kids are in Karam, Karam Lab. And that's just the basics of learning the, the curriculum, the equipment, learn, meeting their mentors, meeting each other, learning to respect the space, respecting each other, all of the, the codes of conduct that we have, which are not too many, but it's just to keep everything like running smoothly. Um, and then they learn how to use all of the equipment because some of it is dangerous. Mm. Uh, but then, um, and after, and they have to prove that they actually attend the 15-week course. So sometimes kids come and like, this is not for every single kid. Right. So if they don't attend, then they, they, like, we need to open up the space for others. So commitment is the only thing we ask of them. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Um, Bobby, thank you for joining us. Um, you, you've done quite a bit of work on diaspora communities in Europe and the United States and how they've mobilized and gotten involved. And so I'd love to hear kind of from your perspective, just your reaction to Lena's work, yeah. but also if, um, you know, how can we draw some connections between sure. the Syrian case and the experiences of other communities? Sure, and I, let me thank you for having me. And mm -hmm. it's great to be with you again, Lena. Um, I, I just wanna echo a point or, um, that you asked earlier about, um, are the states doing this kind of work? And I've, I've spent 15 years working on refugee issues um, there are six million Syrian refugees in Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey, mm -hmm. and there's no one anywhere out there doing what Lena is doing. Nobody. Mm -hmm. And it's inspiring, it's powerful, and it's transformative. And um, I think it's, it couldn't be any more important because in most cases, um, displaced persons spend 20 or 30 years, whether we're talking about Somalis in Kenya, Afghans in Pakistan, or Syrians. Going home doesn't happen. So the kind of work that you're doing in this um, grand ambition to scale this up to 10,000, I know Lena's talking about 10,000, I'm sure she's really talking about far more than that. Um, so what I've spent the last couple of years looking at is, is thinking about how, to, how do various diaspora communities engage and, and get involved, and that's um, how I learned about Lena's work. And it's worth noting that in the US, uh, there's nearly 30 some odd organizations that were started by Syrian Americans, doctors, lawyers, engineers, who were deeply, deeply troubled by the lack of engagement uh, by the Obama administration. And mm -hmm. so they um, raised hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, it's remarkable. Yeah. And have been involved in work that uh, spans every facet of uh, the displaced experience. Um, so it's, it, it's pretty incredible what, what the U.S. has done. And I, I think that you've seen in the U.S., um, relative to Europe, far more engagement by, by the Syrian um, diaspora. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. What, what is the engagement, um, the nature of the engagement in the United States with Karam Foundation and Karam House? I'd be curious to know that. I mean, we, uh, we're funded almost entirely by individuals. And actually, more than half of the people that contribute to Kedem are not Syrian. Um, and a lot of Americans, mostly from America, but we do have international people, like people from Europe and um, different places in the world. But we have an overwhelming um, group of American donors and contributors of all different kinds, you know, from crowdfunding all the way to like a family foundation, but uh, people really re connect with this work a lot because they do see that it's, it's not about just feeding and giving water or food, which are also very, very important in certain situations, but the problems that we've seen in the humanitarian space in Syria have been, and I'm sure that you, you both know more than me because you're engaged in different, you've been engaged in different crises in the past, but for me to be exposed to what happened in Syria is really, really um, shocking to know that, for instance, you know, billions of dollars were spent on you know, food baskets, for instance. Everybody wants to deliver food baskets, baskets in right. Syria, where everybody knows actually inside Syria and in refugees, nobody is dying of hunger, except for the areas that were under siege or are under siege and those areas no, nobody could reach. 
and people died of starvation out of like of enforced sieges and but at the same time we're just distributing food baskets because that's the easy thing to do i mean that's really like the and i know that things the way that refugee camps were set up you know you don't set up a refugee camp until you know that they're going to be there for 18 years whereas when it's, when syrians are getting involved in this for us i tell people i, I want to wake up tomorrow and they're not to have a reason for Karim to exist like we want to work ourselves out of existence but what we realize by working with a lot of the UN agencies and the really big agencies is that they need to have a crisis going on to grow the organization itself, which was started to actually end the crises. Mm -hmm. And it's the world works in a really messed up way, I yeah. can tell you. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but that's like that's really it's really really sad that things are not done this way um, to actually motivate people to not be a burden, motivate people to have agency. You know, kids knowing that they 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 can actually change something in their own communities. That's yeah. a really big deal. And once they learn that, you can't unlearn that having agency. Yeah. You want to say add yeah, to just that? To, just to um, a point to touch on here and thinking about um, Syrian American communities and engagement. One of the things that, that I realized in 2015 and 2016 is that, um, to your point, you, we had all of this activity going on by the international community, but there was very, very little engagement from my perspective on the policy level between the policymakers and folks like Lena. And I thought it was an enormously missed opportunity because I, I know that the State Department and at USAID, there was very little engagement. The engagement was largely at the White House bringing in um, very wealthy Syrian Americans who were venting about the situation rightfully. Mm -hmm. But what I thought was missing and what I think is desperately needed is to try and find a way where you can, ha in a structured way, um, have government engagement and multilateral engagement with folks like Lena. Um, and, and what she's doing is truly exceptional, but there are 30 other organizations across the U.S. that are also doing really important work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a much larger conversation to be had about the role that American diasporas can play in development. And I, I do think that the Obama administration had you know, tried in a variety of ways to respond to whether it was um, kind of a humanitarian disaster that just happened or if it was something more longer term and looked at those and, and thought, oh, maybe the diaspora could get involved in this because they're doing a much better job than we are. Mm -hmm. But it's not as natural of a relationship as, as we might assume. And it's, it's quite difficult to get kind of government to collaborate with non-government, especially on the citizen side. And um, no one in the government, for example, is actually, there's no part of the government, US government that I know of that's actually designed to implement programs that you're doing, right? They could financially support yep. that sort of thing, right? But um, the whole aid and humanitarian infrastructure is, is, seems to be geared towards disaster response and relief, yeah. which is what we're getting at, right? And it doesn't focus anymore on things like infrastructure building or long-term kind of investment in people. I, and I do think it used to be geared that way when perhaps America had a different kind of foreign policy as well, right? Yeah, and, and it's also worth noting, I mean, the Syrian community isn't a monolith. I mean, there are lots of different views on how to engage with Syria, um, I, one of the things that I've seen, and I would be interested to hear your views on this, but I mean, I've heard some Syrians across the country who are really fatigued by the situation, mm -hmm. and as much as they don't like the current regime, they're, from their perspective, they, they do think that there should be a discussion about reconstruction. Mm -hmm. But I meet just as many Syrian Americans who say, how can we possibly talk about that when people are yeah. still under siege and yeah. dying? I think that's true. I think people have gone through so much trauma and pain and loss. I can't blame anybody who can return to Syria without fear if they, if they return. Actually, I'm very happy when I hear people going back to Aleppo or Damascus because you know the country needs its people. But the thing is, and then I would desire that too. I mean, um, we all at some point in our advocacy even, you know, if, if the solution to the war was for this regime to stay in place, but the, the barrel bombs would have stopped yeah. and the chemical weapons would have stopped. We advocated for even like, let, it, let, the, let the regime stay, but the killing stop. This regime is not something that some, yeah. they will not stop. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a very bleak time in the Arab world now, just what's going on right now with Saudi Arabia. I mean, this is just, this, this is what happens um, in, in prisons to 
hundreds and thousands of people across the entire Middle East every single day. And we will never know their names, and we'll never know what's happened to them, uh, but, but that's, the, that's the real fear. And I think that people sometimes, you know, they are very tired of the war, they're tired of, there's many Syrians in America who are family members of Syrian Americans, and they want to go back home. Mm. And so if that comes at the cost of like living under this dictatorship and they don't, they, they, they feel that they're going to be safe, I don't blame them. But you cannot, this is a, some, it's a regime that you can't negotiate with. The, the, just, the, just like, you know, the, the old city of Aleppo, I was um, a student in the 90s in Syria. And then in the 2000s when I was here, I, we were part of this whole like reconstruction of the old city of Aleppo rehabilitation of the old city of Aleppo, which was being done um, by different groups, the European groups and American groups that poured millions, hundreds of millions to build, to make that look like that, what it is. It wasn't like that before. Mm. It was crumbling. And the regime bombed it all. And guess what? The same people that funded it are now looking at funding it again. And it's like, do you, are, are you serious? And so it's like, how does this actually happen in development in the world that, okay, like, let's just rebuild it again? You're re you might be rebuilding the, the buildings, but what about the people? Right. And so that's where, we, where I see like rebuilding is not about just rebuilding the buildings and making things look like making a few areas in Aleppo and Hamas and Damascus look pretty again and having the restaurants and all that. That's not what the problem in Syria is or was. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I, just, I guess I have a question to, to pivot to the positives, which you do better than anyone. Mm -hmm. And all of these kids that that you're working with just seems so, so inspired and inspiring. And when you talk to them, when you're there, what, what do they tell you about the future? I mean, are they, I, it, it doesn't look like they're talking about the politics of no. Syria. It Nobody's looks like they're figuring Syria out, like, how do I make true. a new, <laughs> you know, I, things that I can't even imagine having this. So I'm just. Yeah. And to add to that, um, what about the diaspora then, yeah. which has seen waves of politics affect its families and its communities? What happened, and we've talked about this, kind of what happens to that um, kind of consciousness in the community about being Syrian, uh, about a Syria that doesn't exist anymore, yeah. and that the further you get from the conflict in terms of time, the less real it seems in some ways. The kid, well, the future and the past. Yeah. Um, the kids are really, really amazing. Nobody talks about Syria, and nobody talks about return. That's happened, like that was a few years back when we would not hear that at all. Um, unless you, you, if you have to, if you have to um, actually like prod them to get that and you, we, we avoid that at all costs. And plus, just so everybody knows that in our programs and in Karam House, there is no religion or politics. So we do not bring any of that into the space in anything that we do. All of it is outside, like it's, it's a bubble. Um, but if kids bring up, you know, what's happened to them, obviously we have, you know, we work with them on their trauma and that kind of thing, but we don't bring it up, which is also a problem that I've noticed in psychosocial mm -hmm. interventions with um, refugees and displaced people. A lot of it is bringing up that trauma to get those like dr sad drawings and all of this stuff. But the kids, what they, um, they talk about the future. We, they talk about what they want to be. So that's a really important question for us. We always are asking them, what they want to be and the, and they have to be they, they become okay with that changing so some people want to be like a chef and a doctor but they say like I know that that's crazy and then we <laughs> tell them no it's not crazy it's actually totally cool and then they understand like yes it's not like the Syrian way of I have to be a doctor or an engineer they want to be an animator they want to be writers they want to do all this stuff and we bring people there that are these things and people who've had two or three careers and they tell them you know you might not go to university right, right away and that's okay or you might not practice what you studied and all these things are like mind-blowing to this to them yeah. not just because they're refugees it's just so so foreign mm -hmm. and they become okay with that um, we also it's really important like we have all the technology but we don't let them think that technology is a solution a technology is only a tool to build your idea and so that's really important too because on the other side of things you know you have the tech community, um, most of it in Silicon Valley, they have ideas of how do you solve these kinds of problems and let's teach everybody how to code. Let's teach everybody how to code is not a solution because not everybody wants to code. Mm -hmm. um, so they learn how to code and then some of them will become really amazing coders and some of them won't and that's okay. So we allow them to have that freedom of becoming what you want to be and also knowing that that could change. Mm -hmm. And that alone really shifts their minds and how they think and what they want to do. And um, 
you know, we've had workshops that were like legal workshops or philosophy workshops, and we thought nobody was going to sign up for them, and everybody came. Everybody came. Mm -hmm. in the le in the, and so in the legal workshop, they had mock trials. And the mock trials were about um, mock trials and mock cases. And they were about Black Lives Matter. They were about you know women's movements. They were about all these things that you would not think that it's like for Syrian refugees, that's opening up the world to them. It's yeah. not about their own circumstance. And they learned about this stuff. They learned about Shakespeare. They learned about philosophy. They learned, they learned about so many different things. They have a lending library, and they're const kids are constantly taking books out. It's just it becomes like a culture. And so for that's the past part. <laughs> Um, what it is like to be a Syrian, that's the hard part. Like for people like me, you know, when I go in, um, I, I, I don't talk about um, Syria like that anymore, like the way I do when mm -hmm. I talk about Syria when I'm in the United States or at a talk or something, because for a lot of these kids, they don't know the Syria that I grew up in. And they, they, it, for them, it's almost like a mythical country, a mythical place. I do think about when we're going to be ready to have workshops actually on memory mm -hmm. and collective memory because I think it's very important for them to understand um, that Syria was a beautiful, diverse place that was very peaceful and people were very close to each other um, and they need to know their history beyond just you know, the revolution and the war and being displaced. Uh, but I don't think that we're there yet. But it is, it is very, very difficult because the longer this, this has happened, that kind of two, there's two kinds of Syrians is becoming more and more a reality. Yeah, well, and also when these children go out into the real world, they'll have that personal narrative that was shaped by being at Karam House, but they're going to come into contact with these other stories, essentially, right? Absolutely. And so I, I think that there's so much more interesting growth and yeah. development and, and some of it will be hard for them, of course, yeah. you know, and being confronted with these other Syrias when they finally get out there. Yeah. Um, but one, um, of, one of the kids it was really funny because they came, they, I asked one girl um, when I was in Rehandi about six months ago, I said, why did, like, how did you find out about us? And she said, I kept hearing about Karam and hearing about Karam and I, every day I would dream that Karam would come here and then you did come. And that was like really like amazing. Lovely. Yeah, <laughs> lovely. Let's open it up to the, um, to the audience for some Q&A. We'll have mic runners. And just raise your hand. Give us your name and affiliation. We've just got a, about 10 minutes before the reception. Don't be shy. Yes, please, over here and wait for the mic, please. Hi, I'm Julia. Um, I'm with the One Journey Festival, and we were so pleased to be able to host some of your work last year. Um, my question is about unaccompanied youth, um, and if you have programs that are specifically designed for unaccompanied youth, do you find that there are unaccompanied youth in Turkey? Um, what, is, what does that look like, and can you provide a little perspective about you know, how, how their journey might have been different? So the majority of unaccompanied youth you would find in Greece and the journey to, towards Europe. So that's not something that we encounter a lot. But we do encounter a lot of orphans as well as um, kids in child labor. And that's a whole other program that we do. It's called Sponsor Syrian Refugee Family that we actually started because of um, Elan Kurdi's image actually created such a huge um, viral reaction and people wanted to donate so much to so the funny thing is when people see these images they want to we were getting constantly bombarded by people who wanted to support refugees in America like can I have a refugee in my home because they saw that image and, and like we don't have barely any refugees in America and now actually we have like under President Obama about 20,000 refugees, 23,000 um, were accepted in the United States. And under President Trump, we've had barely any. I think the number for this year is 26, just, just 26 um, out of the 5 million. Um, so that's actually ended. So we, what we did was we actually created this program so that we could stop the um, families making the deci decision to get on the boats. And so what we found is that there are lots of cases of child labor. And so we've stabilized many, many families. We have 400 kids in this program. And we do social contracts with the families that we will provide support on condition that their kids go to school and they can't work and they can't be married under 18. And so this has been a really successful story 
story for us because a lot of these kids end up attending Karam House too. So there's one girl named Iman who was our first family that we sponsored in 2015 and she was nine years old working at a gas station and then we basically sponsored her family and she's one of the girls who created a prosthetic. So you can change their lives so quickly but for unaccompanied minors that that's a problem that a lot of people like there's many kids in Greece they actually have camps specifically for unaccompanied minors and uh, because of the the laws and the things that changed in Europe between Greece and Germany and the whole and all the countries in between we there was a lot of many families have been separated um, because they some people got to Germany and then there were others left behind Thank you. The one right up here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Siobhan, former Karam intern, and now um, I work at the Women's Democracy Network at IRI. Um, so I'm interested in um, like whether these leadership positions are transferring into their local communities. So are they able to kind of take that and be working um, as leaders and kind of being connected um, in the community? if there are opportunities for them to be doing that. So we're not there yet. That's the plan. Um, we, 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 have, we have a scholarship program. So the interesting thing about Turkey is that they accept um, the Syrian students can enter university and they don't have any tuition for all Syrian refugees. So the scholarships that we actually are providing are GAP scholarships for the, the segment of the, the community that they're actually students that got accepted into university. They don't have to pay a tuition, but they were still impoverished to the level where they can't leave you know, their families, they can't pay for the travel, they can't you know, not work um, to support their families. So that's like a scholarship. Imagine, I mean, you're, you're a student that you have a scholarship to a university and you can't even have attend. So that's taking a whole segment of kids that actually deserve to go and, and sending them there for a very little amount of money. I mean, it's really around $1,500 for the whole year to send a student to university for that gap funding. Um, that's one track towards leadership. You know, our definition of being a leader is either having, be, having a completed higher education or having um, gained the skill set to be able to have a job that's competitive in the global economy, so not just any job. Um, so what we will be building out coming um, soon, hopefully, you know, in the next year or two, we'll have a, a whole other, um, like, it's almost like Kerem House for young adults, for the 18 to 25 year olds. Um, oh my God, people are in the organization are gonna be so mad that I'm saying this <laughs> <laughs> publicly, but this will happen. I imagine it kind of like a we work for refugees. Um, so, you know, you would have this space function for young adults separate from the times when it's open for kids and they would still have access to all of the equipment and the Wi-Fi and actually the, um, the connections to the jobs. So maybe they start as interns, virtual interns, maybe they start putting together a company. May, they, the possibilities are really endless and that's what we want to, like, it's almost like a mini a ref, an incubator for refugees, um, really doing whatever they want to do. But we also want to see refugees getting jobs, like the kids getting jobs when they're old enough. So that's what we want to see happen. Um, the really amazing thing about this curriculum is that um, Nuvu Studio d designed this um, specific platform, and so everybody can uh, the platform. If you look at keram.nuvu.org, um, you will see all of the projects, but more importantly, it serves as a documentation of all of the studios, so you can see who taught a studio, which kids were in the studio, what were the projects, but the flip end of this is that when a student leaves Kerem House and wants to find a job, maybe they're not in Turkey anymore, maybe they traveled somewhere, maybe they just are like applying for a job um, and somebody asks them, like if you say, I know how to do like graphic design, I know how to do 3D design and fabrication, I know how to like photograph mm -hmm. or whatever, and then, and then this person asks them, well, how do I know? You, they have an online portfolio forever of all of their skills, their work, their letter of, letters of recommendation. This is stuff that when, when people had to flee Syria, they were leaving without these kind of documents, and now that lives online for them as a resource forever to really prove that they can do these skills. So that's also a piece that will take them towards leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Siobhan. Good question. Yeah. That's an exciting program, yeah. too, right over there. Hey, um, I'm Judy. I've been associated um, as a host family with Ref America, an organization that brings Syrian teenagers to Washington 
to wow. essentially learn how to tell their stories. Um, and I think what you're doing sounds <coughs> so fabulous. Um, does Caterham House have plans to um, open a school in the United States? Oh, I would love that. <laughs> Not, we don't have plans for that, mm -hmm. but I, I definitely see the need. I, I see this also it connects to what Shamila was saying is that, you know, with time, you know, how long, how long are people refugees? Mm -hmm. And for instance, in Turkey, all of the kids are actually in Turkish schools now um, and are learning Turkish. So like how long would we need to be teaching Turkish, for instance? Um, what, we, when, or in America, all of the kids go automatically to, to schools and all, like, all the refugee kids that we know here, like we, in Chicago and in the States, they all know really good English within like a year of being here. What, when, it, when does it become important to start teaching Arabic? Arabic or Syrian culture and so I, I imagine a version of Karam House existing in Europe, Canada, the US in the future if we would need to to be to be serving that um, component of how do you how do you stay Syrian in a way um, and I think that's going to be really important for the kids especially who have left you know the immediate region over here uh, I'm Wing Chen. Uh, the second photo of your presentation has been strongly impacted the American mass media. Uh, does your foundation own the copyright of the photo, please? No, I don't know. We don't. I mean, I've, it's been all over Elan's picture. Yeah. yeah. Can I actually ask mm -hmm. a follow up sure. question? I, I just. Um, you know, in the U.S., both under the Obama administration, certainly under this one, there's been a raging debate about how many refugees to take in um, to the country. And, and I don't think any of us, I, I hope that none of us on this panel would disagree that we should be taking more refugees. But I guess my question is that most of your focus is on how to help them there. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like the policy questions like this to me would be something where you could get bipartisan support because what you're talking about is how do we help refugees where they are? Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, have you had, if you can share and want to share, much engagement with folks up on the Hill because I just feel like you're going to have folks on both sides of the aisle who would say, yeah, this makes sense. No, I don't, we haven't had that much engagement, but I do think that that would make a lot of sense. And we, this is something that we were really, really, we, this is, we were never looking into how do we bring, how do we physically bring refugees here or work on that. We were always advocating that the U.S. should be opening their doors to more refugees because that's basically what America should be doing and that's, you know, the America that I know, um, that we should be opening up our doors to people that are fleeing the terror that they were. But, um, but our work has always been focused on helping people where they are. I just, I ask that because yeah. under the best of circumstances in any given year, the international community takes in less than 1% of refugees. Yeah. I mean, since 9-11, we've taken in 900,000 refugees. Yeah. And so refugees are staying in the neighboring states. And so the work you're doing just would seem to lend itself to, you know, I, I, in my mind, there's, there's an argument, a policy to say, why can't we, you know, we, the international community, more support to help folks like yeah. you? So I, I, and I think there's several layers to that. Just, I, I, you know, from the State Department respect, perspective, like having worked there and know the, you know, having known those folks that work on these programs, there's definitely an interest and investment in the subject matter, right? And there's a distinct role that the State Department has played in that. And I think when there's the transition from Obama to Trump administration, a lot of people felt like there was a loss given the shift in policy. Mm -hmm. At the political level, I think there's a debate amongst Americans over should American taxpayer dollars pay for this sort of thing. Then there's another debate over should it even exist in the country? Should refugees even be here, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because in, in spirit, I think that you know, a lot of people would actually give their own money to make this work. The private philanthropy prospects mm -hmm. for this in the United States are very strong. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's gotten wrapped, the, the whole kind of issue has gotten wrapped up in this partisan debate, which is related to so many other issues, right? And I think the State Department's work has really been held hostage to that um, because there is, a, you know, a lot of that money from the State Department was going into these 
welfare organizations at the state level, right, that were receiving the refugees, mm -hmm. and they only had a certain amount of money that lasted, you know, for whatever it was, the first three months, three months yeah. right? And then it's really up to local community organizations. Yeah. And I've worked with some of them in northwestern mm -hmm. Ohio, and they are literally working for yeah. free, essentially, yeah. right? And in the absence of Karam houses in, say, Ohio or southern mm -hmm. Michigan, there are informal social structures yeah. that emerge to take care mm -hmm. of these um, families who essentially become permanent residents, right? Because they've come here legally, but they don't have the kind of resources that, say, I growing up in Northwestern Ohio had, right, yeah, to succeed. And they that's have to your, have the local community. And you're basically trying to give them, you're trying to give refugees the same chance that any normal kid in that society would yeah. have, right? Yeah. Which I think is a very ambitious goal, and you're reaching for the stars, which is, I would expect nothing more from you. <laughs> um, I, and a closing thought on that, I. I loved your comment that all refugees should have this if it doesn't matter which conflict they're yeah. coming from, right? And that to me as a kind of a practitioner of policy and as somebody who engages with students who are going to go out into this world and deal with these issues is so, I mean, there's so much potential there and there's a lot of potential to reshape it according to the, the conflict that you're coming from or the situation that you're in. I, I'm just, my mind is racing with ideas and how, do, how would you do this with Afghan refugees in Pakistan? Mm -hmm. yeah. Where the, the main goal is actually just to help them get back, mm -hmm. not to help them survive there, yeah. right? And, and this has been going on for a much longer time mm -hmm. period, in fact. So um, with that, I, I wanted to thank you for giving us um, your vision and kind of how you've chosen to implement it and the inspiration to kind of do more with it. It sounds like the questions from the audience have given you a lot more work to do when yes. you go back <laughs> home to your team. And so we wish you all the best. And, thank you so much. Thank um, you. And thank you, Bobby, for your time. And Bobby also has some really interesting research coming out in the next few weeks on Muslim Americans and uh, you know feel free to talk to him about that during the reception. Um, the reception is just through the doors. Um, the exhibit is just in the far back um, room of this building and you'll get to see some of these photos and other other images as well. So thank and you very much. Too. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.